as you're all aware, it's not just the story of America after the, the Civil War, but those transportation nets have everything to do with why we are where we are and how things develop. The whole narrative, the story, is all tied to opening up those transportation routes. Sounds boring, but the fact of the matter is that almost everything that happened here in some way or another was tied to transportation routes that had its own baggage politically, economically, uh, that socially. That, uh, and so, so when we're talking about pioneers, also probably some of you are aware that the, the root of that word has to do with blazing the trail, with opening up the road. So whether you're talking about a railroad or a military road, uh, whatever you're discussing, that in fact, that story is the story of transportation nets. And a key event for our county uh, happened in September of 1888. And we don't talk about the fact that, okay, very shortly thereafter, the railroad bridge that was the focal point for all this excitement collapsed and had to be replaced. That's not the point. We're not going to talk about how parts of the Seattle, Lakeshore, and Eastern were built on, on crappy uh, material that sh shifted and uh, washed away and had to be replaced with real honest to God. Well, anyway, that's a whole other story. Those are, those are tales for another time. What we're talking about is the excitement of a community that after waiting more than a quarter of a century for a real honest to God connection to the outside world that wasn't tied to that river that ebbed and flowed on their doorstep, uh, that this was, this was, a, uh, this was an, ex an event that caused an excitement that's still tangible in the community. You can walk the streets of Snohomish and still see the buildings that went up as a result of the enthusiasm and the optimism and the money that became available uh, to build and to invest oneself in the community. Uh, so, so, um, I want to try and put that into some sort of context, and for those of you who've, who've heard me present on Snohomish before, I apologize for all the redundancy, but you know, it is just, just one, one part of the story of Snohomish County, and, and uh, I, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity. The community itself has welcomed me into their bosom, and after the events of the late 19th century when we stole the county seat from them, it's amazing to me. And I said the way we <laughs> normally would treat carpetbaggers had something to do with tar and feathers and rails, but not the kind of rails that, uh, well, anyway. So, so it's, it's wonderful the way those stories and that rich heritage that is the story of Snohomish fits into what we're doing. And, and, I, and I, have to, I have to go back to a beginning that actually has to do with, with roads. In, in, in Snohomish's case, a road <laughs> that justified its existence uh, but was never built. Um, Emory can to Ferguson, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna find much Snohomish County territorial history that was written that doesn't involve Old Ferg. Uh, E.C. Ferguson was not only the founder of the town, he, his presence, I think, had a lot to do with the character of the place, a place that could uh, settle into the bad times in a cooperative sort of way with a kind of a, kind of a folksy um, good nature. Uh, uh, when George MacDonald, an Eastern publisher, came in and was working for the Snohomish Eye for a while in the 1890s, he was really amused by it because it was very egalitarian is that people, the Ferg was completely, utterly approachable and at the same time represented all the, all the vague, mystical incanabula that had to do with the beginnings of the community. Because he was the guy that was there in 1859, before there was anything going except the rumor of a pig war. Uh, bad thing to gamble a lot of money or time on, but down at Stillicum, uh, at the time, people were figuring there was a real strong possibility. They already had some front money to build a military road that would connect Stillicum with Bellingham Bay. With the idea that you're going to build it a far enough inland that the British Navy can't get a look at you and shoot you, and that you'd be able to transport men and munitions along a military road because we were going to be at war with Britain again. And of course, to everyone's dismay, that didn't pan out. You just cannot count on those politicians coming across for you when you really, really need them. Instead, they actually, they canceled uh, the fort up at Bellingham. And Snohomish, the, well, the idea for Snohomish uh, suddenly was without a uh, raison d'etre. Well, immediately Ferguson and some of his, and some of his friends began thinking about, okay, where's the latest gold strike we can cash in on? And at that point in southern British Columbia up on the Similkameen River, there was, there was something happening. So Ferguson and his pals immediately began a trail and a fellow by the name of Edson Cady who owned most of the east part of what's now the old part of, uh, of Snohomish. See, we can kill that light back there. Can I just turn those, what's left on there? Ah, great, great. 
that, uh, that they, they headed off over the Cascade Mountains through what is still called Katy Pass and then up, headed directly north up the, uh, up the east side of the, uh, the Cascade Range up to the Similkameen with the idea that Snohomish if it couldn't be the focal point where people needed to cross the Snohomish River to get men, to get soldiers and goods to fight, to fight the British Lion, that we could, uh, we could stake them to a trip up the other side of the mountains via Snohomish to get to the Similkameen mining region. <coughs> Sadly, the Similkameen paid, but played out just as disappointing as the, uh, as the Pig War did. Uh, but that was only one of a of myriad uh, efforts that were made by Old Ferg and his pals to try and develop an honest-to-goodness town uh, in the middle of the wilderness, a very precocious thing to do. Uh, it was so precocious that when Snohomish County was created uh, in 1861, uh, it was about the only real focal point in the area that was established as Snohomish County. Snohomish County was created out of, the, out, of, out of a portion of Island County, the mainland portion, made no sense to be calling this area Island County, uh, but Ferg explained in his own way, as he always did in after dinner speeches that were memorably recalled by old timers for decades and generations later, that the reason that Snohomish County was created, that the guys down in Olympia discovered that they had more politicians than they did counties, and unwisely, rather than kill off some of the politicians, they created new counties for them to represent. Of course, this was all happening at an amazing transition time because in 18, 1860, when the politics of it were going down, this gentleman had just, was just about to take over the White House. <clears throat> and as happens in so many cases, which side you're on has everything to do with the way it turns out. Ferg was, uh, was close to people who were close to the rail splitter. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, down in Stilcombe, he'd hooked up with a guy whose brother was the governor of a of a Midwestern state and who himself personally knew Abraham Lincoln. William Henson Wallace might have played a bigger role here in Washington territory if he'd uh, taken the governorship that he essentially had in his grasp and threw away uh, for political power in Idaho territory, just over the mountains and off, off beyond Spokane. There was this whole fresh territory and he wanted to be in the legislature back in Washington, D.C. He eventually wound up being the governor of Idaho uh, and uh, was one of the guys that uh, refused an invitation to, uh, uh, to a night of entertainment at Ford's Theater uh, with Abraham Lincoln uh, in, in 1865. He and Mrs. Wallace decided they were going to go to bed early that night, so missed one of the major events of the uh, Lincoln administration. Wallace actually at one time, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> had a proxy holding the area that's now the Harvey claim, where the, where the uh, airfield is, uh, uh, on, uh, for him. Uh, he had a, a gentleman come up there and, and stake a claim and uh, a net, uh, originally William Henson Wallace, that Wallace, Idaho, Wallace Wallace, the first governor of, of Idaho territory was, was, going to, uh, was going to settle in on himself. Uh, it didn't, didn't work out that way once the railroad wasn't, or the, when the military road wasn't built and there was no other connection to the outside except the river, uh, he sort of faded away and went on to other political, political aims. The American Civil War, of course, also very shortly was to confuse matters uh, for people like uh, W.H. Wallace. But, but Ferguson, uh, Ferguson had already been to California and Oregon and up to British Columbia. Uh, nearly, uh, nearly sunk in the boat that came back down from British Columbia. He was, he was stony broke by that time. He had, he had stayed in Westchester, New York, where he, where he was born and raised, long enough to get a full apprenticeship as a carpenter for, for his parents' sake, more than anything else. They didn't want him going off completely unprepared for the cruel world out there. So he followed his brother to California. He, he, sought, he sought gold. That was what he was looking for. There you see him seated, seated in the wicker chair uh, on the, uh, on, in front of the little house that he prefabricated down in Stillicum and shipped up the river. The idea was this house is going to be at the crossing on the river for a major military road didn't happen. Uh, what happened was that Ferguson wound up being a Republican in the middle of a county that was virtually uninhabited except for Native Americans waiting for the implementation of a treaty that was a result of the 1855 treaty signing. And uh, Ferguson uh, found himself um, in a spot that for reasons that he knew best and hinted at in later, in later years, uh, 
satisfied something in him. Is he found the spot on the planet that he really wanted to be at. And here, and this, this picture was taken, it's a stone's throw from the Snohomish River. The little house is still there. Uh, if you have never visited the little house that Ferguson shipped on a side wheel steamer up the Snohomish River in 1859, it's the oldest building still standing in Snohomish County. It was back before the American Civil War and is a, is a monument to the, to the uh, craftsmanship and skills of E.C. Ferguson. His, uh, his carpenter's apprenticeship stood him in good stead. Still using those cool little square-headed nails, a uh, wonderful little building. Some of the six over six double hung sash windows are still just the wavy ones you see in this picture taken at the turn of the century when he sold it to McGinnis, the guy that's off to the left of him there, who moved it back a little ways, moved it a little bit east, and built a much bigger house on that spot, right on the banks of the Snohomish River. This, this little house turned out to be a very important spot because uh, when Ferguson first uh, uh, got involved in, uh, in the politics of Snohomish County, uh, this was kind of the, the county seat building for a little while. Certainly it was the seat of, a, of a, a tense event in the waning months of 1860 before the county even existed when renegade Indians arrived on his porch and tried to lure him out. They, they eventually wound up killing a settler just downstream from Ferguson's house. Ferguson waved his musket under their noses and told them to get the hell off his porch and immediately gathered all the settlers out of, in the following few weeks to sign a petition endorsing the idea of making a separate county out of the mainland portion of Island County. Snohomish has the honor of being the first the subject of the first photograph taken that we know of by a commercial photographer in, uh, in Snohomish County. 1865, in the summer, a fellow by the name of E.M. Samus, who was the first photographer to establish residence in Seattle. He's the guy who was responsible for the one photograph we have of Chief Seattle. He uh, headed up to Snoqualmie Falls. The only way you could do it, if you had any sense in those days, you didn't try to cut across the uh, overland from Seattle. You'd come up to the Snohomish River, then go up to uh, Tualco, to the, to the Forks, and then go up the Snoqualmie that way portaging part of the distance rather than trying to cut directly across heavily timbered and brushy land. He got this wonderful photograph of Snohomish or Katyville as it was sometimes called. You see a kind of a scow floating there in the river. Uh, well, that's probably the Minnehaha that was the, uh, remember Minnehaha? She was uh, Hiawatha's girlfriend from uh, Longfellow's poem, Hiawatha. Well, Edson Cady uh, was a steam engineer who ran that thing up and down the river and, uh, and held the eastern part of what's, uh, of what's now the oldest part of, of Snohomish. He was calling it Katyville. So in those days, Samus and these other guys weren't quite sure whether they were in the town of Snohomish or Katyville, but this is what it, what it was. Well, there on the left, you see a little group of buildings, the largest of which was the Blue Eagle Saloon. The Blue Eagle Saloon was right close to where the ferry crossing was. It was sort of a cable ferry that they ran across the river. Uh, however, as you can imagine, when the Pigger War didn't work out, there were enormous numbers of people who needed to get across the river right there. Uh, and uh, they'd actually established that spot for its optimum location as a ferry site. The original military road had been laid out further east over by the Pilchuck. Everybody agreed that was not a good spot for a ferry, so they moved the location of the road. They moved the stakes over a little bit uh, so that they'd be in a good position to be able to get people across the Snohomish River. But it doesn't take many people to create a political rivalry. Uh, the, the Democrats had been in power in Olympia down the territorial legislature, well, since Washington was created, the Washington Territory was created back in 1853. And uh, Muckleteo uh, was in fact founded uh, uh, with, at least in part, because of the intention of establishing a democratic presence in the county they were about to create. Uh, at that time, Ferguson's little village up the river was about all there was in the mainland area that we now know as Snohomish County. And so uh, in the, late in the summer of 1860, they moved uh, uh, a couple of New Yorkers who had democratic loyalties, and those democratic regimes that were about to be swept out of uh, power in, uh, with the arrival of a new Republican administration in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so it turned out that uh, Muckleteo, in the hands of Morris H. Frost, he was a loyal Jacksonian from the, his arrival in 1852 in Washington Territory. He was active in democratic politics and managed in the process to score several really 
posh jobs for himself. Uh, he was the original clerk of the territorial legislature when it began operation in 1853. But uh, he, you could even see, kind of see him squinting in this portrait. His eyesight wasn't that good. And also I think it involved a lot more work that he actually wanted to participate in. Uh, so he, he, he faded out of his role as clerk of the uh, original territorial legislature and took a postmaster job in Stillicum and then eventually wound up moving over to Port Townsend with a very good position as the customs collector over at Port Townsend. He held that for quite a while. In the meantime, actively participating in democratic political rallies and conventions for the whole uh, range of, uh, of uh, the territorial period. Uh, they were encouraging him to move to the mainland. There was this great spot over on a point of land that we know today as Mukilteo. That's what the Native Americans called it as well. A narrow little gooseneck of land stuck out there between a salt marsh and a very, very deep harbor. And uh, Frost moved there. In, 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 old age really with a younger guy who was also from New York, a fellow by the name of Jacob Fowler. Frost and Fowler were a company that ran uh, not only Muckleteo but briefly also had the political power in the form of the county seat uh, for the newly created Snohomish County. Uh, Ferguson immediately set out to rectify that problem. As a matter of fact, in the, in the manuscripts collection at the University of Washington, they still have a remarkable document that Ferg preserved for the rest of his life. This is the concession of the county seat from Jacob Fowler, Democrat, to, to uh, Emery Kanda Ferguson of Snohomish. He says, uh, uh, your note per express was duly received and contents noted. Hill soap, we have none. Uh, I send you half a box of phase soap, hope it will answer. The county seat has just changed from one town to another and the first order of business is the brand of soap that their respective general stores are going to be providing uh, for the settlers. Any of us who had concern about the hygiene of the original homesteaders in Snohomish County can rest assured if that that's the first order of business is soap. It says, I enclose you a copy of our poll and also your certificate as elect of election as auditor and justice of the peace. I don't know as it is necessary for certificate of county seat, but I will send one. We was naturally beat by some of the voters in this neighborhood being too lazy to turn out. We will grin and bear it. The vote was 11 to 17 and was the, just the first of a whole stra string of political victories that Ferguson used to amuse himself during the quiet period that, spent, that followed most of the, uh, of, uh, the territorial years. Uh, his constituents were largely loggers, guys who really didn't care where the county seat was, uh, who were passing through here. Very few of those guys who came and worked for Pope and Talbot in the deep woods uh, actually wound up staying here. Most of them were sojourners rather than settlers, in spite of the fact that in those days, even before the land law had settled down a little, you still could file a preemption claim and uh, establish your right to just about anything that you could actually get yourself to. Ferguson was known in those early days as the king of the county, but the economic realities were firmly in the laps of these two gentlemen from the Penobscot country of Maine who came out to the California gold rush. Pope and Talbot were the lumber dealers in San Francisco uh, who helped uh, feed that boom and who made themselves a small fortune doing it. Uh, they, in 1853, established the first cargo mill up here on Puget Sound. And Pope and Talbot, their, their reputation uh, it didn't take long drifting back to the Penobscot country in Maine where many Maine people uh, figured they wanted to come out here and get rich like Pope and Talbot. The Puget Mill Company that Pope and Talbot built was an, was, uh, an important industrial resource, a beginning really, of Puget Sound's importance as a manufacturer of lumber. And, uh, and they also established a kind of a pattern where, where uh, dare I call them robber barons? That time they were using dummy entry fi uh, filings to acquire uh, land holdings in Snohomish County that you can still uh, you can still trace back through the deeds. Uh, fellows came in and uh, acquired homesteads that they cleared, and the timber went off to Pope and Talbot, and they got a little a little uh, uh, bit of money from Pope and Talbot as they turned over the deeds. At one time, Pope and Talbot owned, owned so much of Snohomish County that they used to bargain the assessor on what they would pay in taxes. Later on, that land became valuable as five-acre chicken ranches in the southern part of Snohomish County, especially uh, Pope and Talbot's holdings uh, still can be traced on maps that it, uh, they, the, the blocks of it still exist uh, to this very day. So Ferguson wasn't really in control of the economic destiny of the area that he was uh, 
that he was described as being the king of. And in fact, uh, the daunting uh, prospects of wrestling with trees this size and bigger uh, didn't make it an especially attractive place for settlers to come. A lot of them who came to do this work uh, didn't leave. Uh, subsequent study has indicated that the jobs involved in hand logging in the, in the woods were just about as dangerous as being on the front lines in a war. And in fact, a lot of the people who weren't killed were seriously injured. A lot of those guys who came out here from Maine uh, looking to get rich uh, got themselves injured or killed working for Pope and Talbot in the deep woods of uh, Snohomish County. Pope and Talbot always liked to buy somebody else's timber before they used their own. So there were, even, even during the uh, times that weren't the very best, there were jobs out there in the woods. But boy, when the bottom dropped out of the economy, like it did in 1873, uh, there were no jobs and there were logs floating out in the bay for, uh, for months, in some cases a couple of years. Again, it was such deadly brutal work that Ferg's constituents in that early period uh, were uh, not necessarily to be envied when they found employment in the middle of nowhere, which is what we were. If you look at a skid road here, uh, you're looking at, uh, at the basic means of getting huge sticks of timber uh, to the Pope and Talbot mill across the bay. And what they were doing was skidding logs downhill into the water and floating them off uh, to the Puget Mill Company's facility. Even the, even the easiest and least risky of these jobs was pretty disgusting because in the backwoods they frequently used dogfish liver oil as lubricant and the stench of uh, sour rotted dogfish liver oil uh, made you not the nicest of companions, even among guys who didn't have access to any facilities to encourage their own personal hygiene to any extent. Three guys from the Penobscot country that were attracted to this area uh, by a promise uh, of Pope and Talbot that was never quite what was expected were the Blackman brothers. Uh, they came out here in the 1870s. They said, they always like to tell everybody the reason they came was that there was that election when the American public re-elected Ulysses S. Grant. And the corruption they felt was so thick uh, on the east coast of America that they were going to go to the opposite side of the continent trying to escape the stench of uh, corrupt politics. And they did exactly that. They came out to Snohomish, which is about as far away from Washington, D.C. as you really have to worry about getting in those days. Uh, hard to get here, a remote place. Cap Blackman, the oldest of the brothers, the lower left there, Cap Blackman was uh, a typical Yankee, however, who saw uh, circumstances that he couldn't believe, opportunities that nobody was taking advantage of. He began introducing steam equipment into the woods. Uh, he basically stole the idea that Dolbeer had patented down in Northern California and began using steam donkey engines up by Monroe by the middle of the 1880s. Likewise, at about that same time, about the time the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern was incorporated uh, in Seattle, uh, he built the first real cargo mill just a little bit downstream from uh, Avenue D uh, on the Snohomish River on the North Bank. Uh, there are so many innovations in here. Um, that tall stack, that's a steam dry kiln, first one in Snohomish County. No point in shipping water and paying for it. Uh, that, uh, that also housed inside the first electrical generators. The Blackmans generated enough electricity to be able to sell a little bit of it off through their electrical company to uh, people in Snohomish. The first electrical power available in private homes in Snohomish County. Uh, that annex sticking out there, uh, that's, that's where uh, they started manufacturing shingles in 1885. Shingles were part of a cottage industry where you had your fro and some shingle blocks and during the winter, you know, it was crummy and sit there under your awning and, and split off handmade uh, shakes and shingles. But the fact is that the first steam powered machine manufactured uh, uh, shingle production didn't really start until the Blackmans fired up with Cap Blackmans patented uh, uh, shingle clipper in that little annex there. And of course a fortnight later the shingle sawyer cut several fingers off one hand uh, in the process and said a pattern for uh, enormous production and enormous uh, physical danger for the people that actually wound up doing it. Sadly this mill burned but this was an example of the kind of industry that began to develop indigenously in the town of Snohomish just about the same time that word came out that the folks in Seattle who were always, always trying to get the better of their rivalry with Tacoma had actually created a railroad company that was going to build a railroad to hook up with a transcontinental line. 
and their initial strategy was to go up the Canadian border and hook up with a Canadian line uh, just beyond the border. Uh, it seemed like a really great idea, uh, especially in places like, like <coughs> Snohomish that looked like they'd be right on that main north-south line. You notice though that when Snohomish wrote about it, and they wrote about it frequently, more often than not they didn't refer to it as the Seattle, Lakeshore, and Eastern, or, or even the S, uh, L, S, and E, which it frequently was called. They called it the Lakeshore and Eastern. Uh, Snohomish at this point, like most other communities, saw every other community in their immediate vicinity, which was to say 100 miles, as a rival. And so they always kind of choked at the idea of referring to that rail line that sprang up in 1883 in Seattle, uh, or the idea sprang up, uh, the process of building it was a little more complicated. Uh, they always referred, they shortened it. It was the Lakeshore and Eastern instead of the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern. And of course, eventually Snohomish got on the map industrially, not just for that cargo mill, but also when Cap Blackman patented a special logging railway system that he began to export out of the town of Snohomish all around the Pacific Northwest. As a matter of fact, the first railroad that really came to Snohomish uh, didn't go anywhere from Snohomish. As a matter of fact, uh, the parts for it weren't even manufactured here. They had to be manufactured in uh, centers that had foundries that could cast, uh, for instance, those beautiful double flanged wheels that they used. This was a logging railway on wooden rails that could be built less expensively, more quickly moved around. Slippery though, really, really slippery. So when they were using oxen or, uh, or horses like the ones you see about to be retired there in the distance, uh, sometimes it was a little deadly. Sometimes logging camps wound up with uh, an extra measure of, uh, of uh, a beef uh, from the oxen that were hauling double flanged wheel cart trucks full of logs that would get away and start going down a hillside because they didn't pay much attention to the normal sorts of grades either. They'd, they'd challenge anything. And so that Boeing over the years has had some problems with the steepness of the grade up, uh, up the gully there from Muckleteo up to their facility. Uh, the Blackman logging system was used with only a few dead oxen and mules uh, uh, in the 1880s before Boeing, long before Boeing arrived in the 1960s. And uh, Cap Blackman and the others again were based in Snohomish but isolated. They were here still at a time when in order to get into town, well you can get up here quite easily in a small boat because as everyone kept track of the tides and everybody knows that the Snohomish River is a tidal river. So you, you could uh, put your boat in at Everett, uh, where Everett eventually was, was built on that naked peninsula that was more of an obstruction to navigation than anything else during the territorial period. Uh, and the flood tide would carry you right up. You didn't have to dip an oar. It just wash you all the way up, back up uh, to, uh, to Snohomish. Uh, and uh, likewise, uh, on, the, on the normal, on the normal uh, flood, the, the patterns of the flood in Ebb uh, made the Snohomish River a two-way two street. Uh, but it still wasn't what they wanted. They needed to have some way to have shipping that could be delivering product and also bringing humanity into their, into their locale. And the Blackmans uh, enhanced the reputation of the community, which still maintained its political power, uh, but it was a, uh, it was a very uh, modest uh, sort of establishment. Uh, as late as, uh, as, the 18, as the end of the 1870s, uh, recovering from the Panic of 1873, Snohomish still was, was not the kind of city that Ferg and the Blackmans really wanted it to be. And here you can see the little cable. This was done at the, at the uh, end of the territorial period. And you can see the cable uh, ferry that extended across uh, the foot of Avenue D before there was a bridge there. Um, the Cathcart Opera House, which was the first museum and library. It had social amenities and, uh, and uh, cultural, uh, uh, cultural accoutrements. Uh, but for the most part, they were waiting for a train. They were waiting for a connection to the outside world. They even, at one point, created their own railway. Some of you may actually own some of the stock for the uh, Snohomish Valley Railway. That, well, they printed a lot of it. Uh, today you can buy it and collectors have been uh, framing them and putting them on their walls. Nice little steel engravings on there to show you the way the, way they t uh, the, the uh, railroad was going to look. Uh, the fact is that was, that was never built. But with the gathering enthusiasm after the announcement of Seattle's uh, rivalry bursting into the creation of a transcontinental railway connection, uh, things got very, very exciting. The arrival of the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern was anticipated almost from the moment that, uh, that the company was created. And one of the first to really benefit 
was a fellow who, like Ferguson, was trained as a carpenter and a builder on the East Coast. J.S. White was a classic Yankee down-home carpenter. In Snohomish in the early days, most of the architects never hung out a shingle as such, and we always do an injustice by generally talking about some of the beautiful old wooden architecture, especially as being vernacular. Uh, so those buildings were almost always carefully designed by someone who was trained to do that. And J.S. White was one of the people that did it most and best for the town of Snohomish. J.S. White's work blossomed during the, uh, during the anticipation of the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern arriving in Snohomish. And today you can still see wonderful examples like Cyphers and Robertson's Saloon across from the Oxford, which of course the Oxford was never really a saloon in the early days, but this building was built in the, at the height of the excitement and the anticipation of the arrival of the Seattle Lake Shore and Eastern. Survival of wooden storefront buildings like this is really comparatively rare. They're subject to so many dangers, fire, rot, but, but uh, seeing well-preserved examples of it in Snohomish uh, has uh, become a, a tradition hereabouts. People go up to Snohomish just to walk around and absorb the flavor of old wooden architecture that goes back to about the time of Washington statehood in 1889. Uh, the Blackmans, well, this is another branch of the same Blackman family. A.M. Blackman was the postmaster and he also uh, ran a grocery store. Today this is the Oxford Saloon. And uh, another wonderful example of J.S. White's work. Uh, he must have been extraordinarily busy during that period when people were expecting to hear the train whistle. Uh, uh, the, uh, the central business district, the residential area of Snohomish is still uh, replete with wonderful examples of period architecture from the drawing board uh, of, uh, of J.S. White, including his own home. Probably the crowning achievement was this wonderful brick building that J.S. White designed uh, the Burns Block is what it was originally called, but down through the years it's had many different names. Uh, now it's back to having a bookstore on the ground floor, which is nice, because one of its first uses when it opened was to house uh, a bookstore. Uh, but uh, it was also a critically important part of the big fire that happened in the spring of 1911, because uh, a, a bad fire that broke out on the south side of First and spread across the street was blocked by the presence of the, of the Burns Block. That was a, ironically called the Burns Block, but it, wouldn't, it didn't burn. So as a result of that, the fire didn't get any further, any further west than just right to the wall you see on the right. It suffered a little bit of damage, but for the most part was a more effective fire block than the one that had been built across the street and uh, wound up uh, being so superheated that parts of it exploded and uh, failed to, uh, to block the uh, progress of the fire. J.S. White also designed a beautiful home for E.C. Ferguson who had one interim residence between the old 1859 cottage and this beautiful house close, as it turns out, right up by the, by the water tank, uh, <laughs> emblematic of the, of the arrival of the, of the Lakeshore and Eastern Railroad, uh, that water tank right on the railroad tracks and not too far from that was, uh, was uh, Mr. Ferguson's house. A wonderful example of the type, a uh, spectacular example of the skills, the aesthetics um, of, uh, of J.S. White. And this little engraving, I get it, I think gives you an idea of how how much that was a part of what Snohomish wanted people to know about, about it. That's part of the image of the community that they wanted to project as the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern slowly worked its way to their threshold. And of course Ferg, uh, well, some of the time even when he wasn't mayor they referred to him as the mayor because he just kind of was the, the old townsman was another phrase that was used frequently. He was the guy who always, who always uh, stood up after dinner and recounted uh, tales, some apocryphal, of, uh, of the early history of the community. Uh, Ferg, Ferg was, here, it was a family man, here you see him with the family in a picture taken, uh, right around the time of the beginning of the uh, Lakeshore and Eastern excitement. And uh, he, he, loved, he loved to uh, remind people of the humble beginnings of the community. Those of you who haven't had a chance to read Dr. Norman H. Clark's book, Milltown, that was published back in 1970, Thinking about the other day now, it's become historical in its own right. There's a wonderful phrase that he uses describing Ferguson, who was invited to, to uh, uh, down to speak at a, at a banquet for uh, Jim Hill, the great northern uh, builder. And uh, <laughs> Clark describes him as the grinning nexus of a grubby past and a shining future. As Ferg had been there when times were really pretty primitive, 
and here he was uh, on site uh, during the moment in which they were going to get those gleaming rails running right through the middle of, uh, of the community that everybody had been waiting for, in some cases, in Ferg's case, for nearly a third of a century. And of course, when it finally arrived, it was like, uh, uh, you see, it, it wasn't uh, particularly exciting or heavy, heavy trafficking. And of course, there was another problem in that that, uh, that, that railroad bridge coming in had uh, collapsed not too long after, after those first trains came through. So for a while, you only could get to Snohomish. You got on the far side of the river, and then they finally got the railroad bridge rebuilt. But this 1890 view of the town of Snohomish, it's kind of eloquent because the rail line and a locomotive on the bridge uh, actually underlines the whole community. Sort of like emphasizes this entire place that was transformed, um, really brought to maturity in certain ways by the arrival of a railroad connection with the outside world. It didn't really matter that the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern was, uh, was uh, destined to exist under that name for a very, very short time. Eventually the Northern Pacific, the rival, the Seattle's rival uh, railroad down in Tacoma uh, was uh, bought it out and uh, it, it never really